Buenas noches, good evening. Welcome to UCSD Guestbook. My name is Jorge Mariscal. My guest tonight is Larry Felton. Mr. Felton is a historical archaeologist with the California State Department of Parks and Recreation. He received his BA in Anthropology from the University de las Americas in Cholula, Mexico in 1975, and he has worked with the California Department of Parks and Recreation since then. Welcome, Larry. Thank Bienvenido. you. Uh, Larry, you are now chief archaeologist uh, down at the Old Town San Diego site, and I was wondering if you could tell us briefly what your team has found down there so far. Right now we're working on uh, the McCoy Silva site in preparation for reconstruction of the McCoy House, a building that was constructed in 1869 uh, and was the home of, of James McCoy, who was a, uh, one of the sheriffs of San Diego and, and later was a senator. Uh, it was uh, quite a substantial building, about 4,000 square feet, and we have a number of photographs and drawings of the building. It was eventually demolished in about 1927, but in order to plan the reconstruction, the architects needed to know, have more information than they could get from just the photographs as to its exact location and its exact size. In the course of doing that work, we did in fact find the uh, foundations, the brick foundations of the McCoy House, and so we're successful in providing the information that the architects needed. But we also found that there are very substantial remains of so much older adobe buildings that uh, had occupied the site prior to the construction of the McCoy House. Uh, now, from historical research, uh, people have long known that, that there were earlier buildings there, although the uh, 1977 State Park General Plan for Old Town had identified the McCoy House as the building that was to be reconstructed on that site. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably from an archaeological perspective, the, uh, old, the, the remains of the older buildings and the associated deposits and artifacts that uh, we, we uncovered are uh, um, what are our most interesting finds to, mm -hmm. to this point. Now this site is down the hill from the Presidio when uh, the Spanish soldiers and their wives started moving down out of the Presidio. Is this one of the sites where they would have established adobes and begun to do some small farming or what actually happened there? Yes, that's what we believe that uh, after the Mexican War of Independence uh, that Re retiring soldiers and their families began to move, move down the hill um, and build homes and, and uh, fields and, and raise crops there. Mm -hmm. Now that pro probably there were activities like that that were taking place during uh, the prior to 1822, well, uh, between eight, 1769 when the Presidio was first established in 1822. Um, but there apparently were no uh, permanent structures there. Um, so once, uh, once people started moving down, they appear to have uh, obtained uh, parcels that would include uh, a piece of high ground for building a house on and then some, uh, some lower parcel, parcels down in the floodplain of the river, which would have been the, the better agricultural land. So uh, the, the actual site is actually close to where the river used to run, which is now uh, kind of parallel to the trolley track, is that? Yes, the, the San Diego River uh, ran down Taylor Street past the big Caltrans building mm -hmm. and then looped around in the area that the new uh, trolley station uh, is now located and then flowed onto San Diego uh, Bay. Now the river actually during the historic period uh, shifted a number of times, uh, it would silt up and, and then it would empty out into Mission Bay. So the river actually moved, moved back and forth at, at various times. Mm -hmm. Now um, the buildings that are on this site, uh, we have very little documentation of their, their origin. We, we really don't know when they were constructed. The first time that they really show up in the uh, in, in the, the docu documentary history is uh, in, on maps and drawings starting about 1849. And then we, 
we do know that uh, Maria Eugenia Silvas sold, the, sold a parcel there that was, I believe, 56 feet by 72 feet to a man named Julian Ames in 1851. So th we don't know how she acquired that property. There's been, you know, a, a lot of speculation, but uh, it also appears from the 1850 census that she was probably living on, on in that block at least, uh, because uh, th the people listed in the census before and after her are people who we do know to have been on the block. So the census does list her and a number of her children there in, uh, or what appears to be there in 1850. You can never be certain of that because the census takers didn't always work completely right. linear, but um, uh, it, it at least is, is uh, a, pr a pretty plausible case can be made for her actually uh, living there. S some have suggested she may simply have owned the property and not been living there, but, mm -hmm. but my belief is that the preponderance of the evidence would, would put her actually living there. Right, and so this Maria Eugenia Silva, uh, turns out, was the daughter of one of the Spanish soldiers who I think we believe was with the De Anza expedition. I believe so. And, um, and they owned properties throughout the area. So does the adobe that belonged to the Silva's family actually, will it now sit under the McCoy reconstruction? Um, there's still some question. We have, in terms of the archaeological evidence, we have got the foundation, a, a rectangular set of foundations that seem to define one building and then several uh, truncated sections of, of foundations that we're having a difficult time reconciling with the historic uh, uh, maps and, and drawings. Uh, it's, it's difficult. These foundations were disturbed uh, by the construction of the McCoy House and, and later its demolition and subsequent construction of a motel on that parking, on that area, and then the parking lot. So uh, the, the one building that is, that is well defined, that we can see the full rectangular perimeter of, uh, appears to be at least in part on the parcel that um, she owned. Uh, def really defining the exact locations of these early properties that we, we have a deed that describes her parcel in some, some detail. But one of the problems is that we no longer have a good set of landmarks to, to relate that description to. For instance, um, uh, San Diego Avenue, which historically was called Garden Street, uh, was widened after the McCoy House was demolished in about 1927. So the early description of uh, Maria's parcel, though, is with reference to that street. So you can see that um, there's a, a fair degree of uncertainty exactly where her parcel was, and as a consequence, it's, uh, it, there's some ambiguity as to uh, which, which of these foundations and the buildings they represent were actually on her parcel. Um, now, um, James McCoy, I'm wondering what we know about him. We, I, I think he was an Irish immigrant who came over in the 30s, perhaps 1830s, and went into the U.S. Army wound up in San Diego and in the Presidio after 1848 and the American takeover. Um, you mentioned that he had been sheriff in San Diego. Do we know anything else about him? Um, uh, yes, he, he later became a senator, and, and I, can't, I can't tell you what, what, what date he, mm -hmm. he, he was elected, but he did serve one term uh, in the state senate. Uh, was apparently quite well-to-do, had very substantial uh, land holdings. Um, he married uh, rather uh, late in life. I believe he was 48 when he, he married. Uh, and that apparently was the occasion for him constructing his, this, this large home mm -hmm. was uh, shortly after he was married. Um, his, um, he died in uh, 1895. Uh, they had no children but adopted, adopted um, there are several people listed as adopted children of, of theirs, including uh, a, a man named Juan Silvas, I believe. Um, he died in uh, 1895, and his widow subsequently remarried, 
um, and lived there, I believe that she died in, in 1919. And there, there's a, a substantial body of historical information on both him and her. Uh, she was, uh, at the time of her death, the probate uh, inventories and such are, indicate that, that she and her, her current husband were quite well to do. They, they apparently, uh, her estate was worth something like a quarter of a million dollars, which in 1927 dollars was substantial. Right. Uh, so um, there's clearly there's many levels of history on this site, and we know that there was a very old uh, American Indian village called Kosoi that ran through this site and all the way up north and south of there. Have you all in your uh, dig found any Native American uh, artifacts or? Oh yes, um, the. In the, in the historic deposits, we have actually a substantial number of pieces of flake stone, of um, unglazed brownware ceramics uh, that appear to have been pieces of predominantly large ollas, and uh, a lot of times they're heavily encrusted with soot, and they appear to have been cooking vessels. Um, there are some other steatite or soapstone artifacts, some pieces of a soapstone bowl that is very likely of Native American manufacture. Uh, there's a soapstone uh, bead. The, the, probably the most interesting question there is, is whether these uh, items represent a prehistoric occupation of the area or uh, represent the presence of Native Americans in Old Town San Diego during the historic period. Um, frequently, uh, there's a sort of an artificial dichotomy made when these things are identified as prehistoric mm -hmm. because they seem to be of Native American origin. Uh, but my, we don't see, and we've been looking very hard on that site for evidence of intact prehistoric deposits, in other words, Native American materials that predate uh, the coming of, of the Spanish. And they don't, they don't seem to be present. Now, across the street, we have uh, defined one uh, prehistoric site that consists predominantly of a rather light scatter of pieces of flake stone and shell. Um, but even that doesn't appear to be evidence of r really long-term or intensive occupation. Um, uh, a number of people have speculated about the location of Kosoi and what Kosoi really consisted of. There's a local archaeologist named uh, Jerry Schaefer who has, has written uh, um, on Kosoi, and I believe that he's suggested that Kosoi is, is really the, the name of a, of a general location as opposed to a specific uh, village site. I think um, that the current thinking would put the, the village itself, the, loca the, the most heavily occupied area, as further, a little bit further up the um, San Diego River mm -hmm. Channel. Um, but it seems, it seems both commonsensical and from what, what little ev physical evidence we have in the park that the, that the Native Americans were using that area um, uh, during the late prehistoric and probably into the early historic period, it appears that the mudflats and, and marshes related to the bay did extend f uh, further up the San Diego River Channel, up to, to and perhaps past the area of Old Town. Mm -hmm. By the 1850s, the maps and things that, w that, that we have seem to show uh, it, that the, the, the river channel flowing past Old Town is mostly a big sandy a, a, a big sandy wash with the mudflats that would have uh, would have had a lot of food resources, uh, um, shell shellfish and birds and that sort of thing, uh, to be to have receded down closer closer to the bay. So I suspect that the that what we are seeing in in the one prehistoric site that's that's clearly undisturbed and clearly below the historic deposits. Uh, represents uh, a rather a rather casual use of that area for gathering and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But on the McCoy on the McCoy Silva site proper, though, um, um, we really haven't seen any uh, any evidence that there's uh, that that there was a real prehistoric use of that area. I suspect that there was, but there uh, 
has been uh, so much construction and stuff. Uh, I think it becomes, in terms of social history, a really significant question to, to get out of that sort of false dichotomy of ascribing Native American materials as being prehistoric. Because one of the things that, that I believe is neglected, um, certainly scholars are paying much more attention to the role of Native Americans uh, in uh, both the Spanish and, and Mexican Republic uh, eras. But I think that, that, this is, that this is an area that needs much more looking at. We do know that uh, Native Americans uh, worked in many of the California households or were, were, were uh, wives of some, of some of these retired soldiers. Uh, cooks, a lot of, apparently a lot of Native American men were, were cooks in California households. So my interpretation of this, the, much of the stuff we find is, is integrally mixed with the other historic materials, the Chinese pottery and British earthenwares and all of those sorts of things. So my belief is that what we're seeing is really a survival of, of much Native American technology and Native American people into the historic period and being an integral part of, uh, of, of the Pueblo mm -hmm. um, and probably providing much, if not most of the labor that uh, right. was expended there. Right. Now you mentioned the Chinese and British ceramics th that tend to be in this kind of area and we know that during the Spanish period there was already a Pacific Rim trade if you will and certainly after 1821 with Mexican independence that trade increases. Can you talk a little bit about the ceramics trade along the Pacific Rim at that time? Yeah. Um, to talk to historical archaeologists you would think that the 19th century was the age of ceramics. It's, I think an, we tend to focus on them because they're durable, they survive, uh, also they change fairly rapidly through time, so they become valuable uh, dating tools. Uh, we know, for instance, that British earthenwares, much like fashion today, change, change fairly quickly, so you can distinguish the 1840s stuff from the 1820s stuff, and so that's why we sort of fixate on, the, on those. Um, it is really a skewed perspective because when you look at the bills of lading and that sort of thing, um, much of the commerce and much of what drove the Industrial Revolution was really cloth. But of course, cloth uh, uh, doesn't usually survive in archaeological context. Um, so anyway, uh, given that though, we do, we do fixate on, on ceramics. At, uh, at this site, we have um, uh, Ch Chinese, uh, British and some Mexican wares now, a as well as these Native American brown uh, brown wares. So we've really got we've really got materials from at least you know four parts of the world. Um, the British wares uh, already by the 1820s had had were f were flooding the world. They're found in Australia and really all over the world. This. Um, the Industrial Revolution was happening in Britain in the 1780s and subsequently. And um, so it was, that, that material was being sent out in great quantities. And as I say, it, it becomes a valuable dating tool for us. It seems that the British materials tended to change stylistically quicker than, for instance, the Chinese stuff. But um, um, I, w I would say in terms of sheer volumes, uh, we, and we have not completed our analysis, so I can't give you hard quantitative numbers, but uh, the, the brown wares that appear to be of Native American manufacture and the British wares are the two, the two most common groups of ceramics that we have there, um, followed by the Chinese materials, and then with really very small, small quantities of, of identifiably Mexican um, ceramics, uh, namely uh, Maiolicas or, or t lead tin glazed materials coming from Puebla and uh, some other plain lead glazed wares. Those, the importation of those to California seemed to have dropped off uh, pretty substantially during and following the Mexican War of Independence. So uh, I suspect that those Mexican materials are uh, perhaps were, th were things, I, I'm sure there were still some coming in, but they may have been things that were 
heirlooms in, in the families that move down the hill. Mm -hmm. The Chinese materials are rather interesting. Uh, we do have some of the same uh, patterns that were uh, very common in the China trade going to Europe and the East Coast. Uh, Canton pattern and Fitzhugh pattern are fairly well-known uh, varieties of Chinese export porcelains. But mo most intriguing to me uh, are another group of uh, styles of porcelain. One is referred to sometimes as Sino-Islamic or Ala and uh, Om. There are, these appear to be, um, these were sort of enigmatic when we started finding them in many of these uh, sites from the 1830s and 40s up and down the coast of California because the standard uh, literature on Chinese export porcelain didn't they didn't show up. Um, and then uh, about in the early 80s, a book was published in Malaysia that, uh, that was almost like a Rosetta Stone. It was suddenly here were pictures of all of these materials that we had been uh, finding. Uh, the upshot of it is that they appear to have been a material manufactured probably for, uh, predominantly for Asian or, or uh, uh, overseas Chinese communities in Southeast Asia. They've been found as uh, far away as the east coast of Africa, and I believe South Africa. Uh, there was a ship named the Diana that uh, uh, wrecked in 1817 in the Straits of Malacca that was on its way to uh, India, loaded with these, uh, these same uh, patterns. Uh, in fact, I just Yesterday, I got an email from a fellow in uh, Alaska, uh, Dan Thompson, I believe is his name, who uh, told me that they have pretty substantial numbers of these same uh, patterns showing up in Sitka. So it really is, look, uh, also uh, Hawaii they're reported from. I don't know about the west coast of Mexico, but it would be very intriguing to see if they're showing up in historic sites in the west coast of Mexico or clear down to, to in South, South America. Yeah. But they seem to, seem to me to be, uh, or it seems likely that they're a manifestation of 19th century uh, Pacific Rim trade. We really were, by the 1820s, we were really into a world economy. So neither, although we, we uh, hear much about world economies and Pacific Rim trade these days, these are certainly not uh, new, new phenomena. Right. Now, going back to the structures, we just have a few minutes left. Um, the, the Old Town General Plan of 1977 makes a lot about um, an equal emphasis on the pre-American period, that is to say pre-1846, say, and the American period, and that the structures in Old Town should represent both periods equally. Um, in your reading of that general plan, or in certainly what's being planned now, it, is there a quality there of reconstruction? Or I, I think the, the plan for the McCoy House suggests that the American period has been emphasized in the past. Do, do, do you see any tendency there? Um, well, as you know, that's been a, a controversial issue. Um, this, this project uh, engendered a, a, a lawsuit, among other things, uh, because there is there was a substantial uh, number of people who, who uh, felt that there were other alternatives besides the McCoy House that might be uh, better, better choices. Um, I think that the, the crucial question here, uh, aside from what my personal opinions might be as to, as to uh, what direction uh, reconstruction and interpretation should take, is that those kinds of decisions are dictated by the general plan. Now, the general plan for Old Town San Diego was approved in 1977, and the McCoy House uh, was the building that was approved for reconstruction on this site. Um, it was, I think, valued for some pragmatic reasons uh, uh, as well as, as its historical significance. Uh, namely, one of, the, one of those reasons is that it's, it's huge. It's about 4,000 square feet. It'll actually be the visitor center. It will, yes, yeah. it, and it's to be the visitor center. So it was, a, it was a building that the planner saw as rather ideal for, for a visitor, for a museum. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly... Um, can, um, there, there certainly are other scenarios that one could, could, can imagine that, that and, and make valid arguments would be uh, 
equally good or better uses of that property in terms of uh, uh, interpreting the earlier period of Old Town's history. Mm -hmm. But I think the key thing for people to realize is that the general plan is what directs, uh, directs this development. Now, I think that this one of the things that this controversy has, uh, has raised is the question of how long is a general plan good for? This current general plan is about 20 years old now, and um, uh, it, I, I think that this whole thing raises, uh, raises the question of, well, it, it points to the fact that history is not really a static reality. History is uh, what, we choose to, what we choose to emphasize uh, or, or dwell on to meet our current needs and, and, and interests. So, the real question in my mind is, uh, uh, and, y and yet we, w this is an official policy document, this, and until it's changed, the uh, direction that is laid out there are uh, what, what the Department of Parks and Recreation proceeds with. Right. Um, okay. So, the, 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 qu the question, to, to uh, no matter how good the idea is for for an alternative development plan, uh, that would re to to embark on that would really require making a revision of the general plan. It's not simply something that you can make a good case for, and then we'll say, okay, we'll do that instead of this. The right. the general plan dictates our our development. Right. Well, thank you for spending this time sure. with us, Larry, and good luck in the rest of the dig. Thank you. And thank you all for watching UCSD Guestbook. Good evening.